Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It is Tuesday, February 11th, 2020. Uh, another big day on the market yesterday. Wow, more records. S&P 500, new record high. NASDAQ, new record high. Uh, a lot of folks don't get it, but a lot of money continues to pour into the equity markets as a result of uh, growth, earnings growth in a very, very low interest rate environment with the Fed sitting on their hands. Uh, not a bad situation for stocks. And I think that's what we're seeing is money just continuing to pour in. Let's uh, go over some of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to give you, uh, of course, my daily market recap, go through and take a look at some of the uh, different areas of the market that performed well, some that didn't. Uh, I'm going to do break it down today. In that, that uh, segment, I'm going to take a look at biotechs and banks and why I think both are going to go higher. Um, earning spotlight, still a number of companies reporting. Actually, uh, each day, uh, I think today, tomorrow, and Thursday, all over 100 companies uh, reporting each of the three days. So still a lot of companies coming through. I would call them mostly the smaller companies or the second tier, third tier uh, companies. Most of the bigger companies have reported, but not everybody is on a calendar year ending 1231. So some companies that may have their quarters ending January 31st, also getting ready to report. Um, after we go through that, do a couple of upgrades, downgrades, and of course, end the show today with three you must see. Uh, these are three charts that just, I think are very interesting and uh, I think you might find them interesting as well. All right, uh, let's jump in and take a look at what happened yesterday. Um, the Dow Jones uh, had another strong day up 174 points. We had actually gapped lower. So we finished the day on Friday week uh, we were down on Friday across the board. We gapped lower yesterday, and right from the opening bell, the bulls came in. Uh, so you can see that hollow candle there on the Dow, opening below the prior close and then moving back higher. The uh, S&P 500, same thing, except actually closed at a new all-time high, 3,352. Had not seen a close above 3,350. 30, so we just keep making our way higher on the S&P 500, and I think that's going to be a theme. NASDAQ, another breakout, uh, 108 points, up over 9,600, closing at 9,628. Big day on the NASDAQ. And you can see on a relative basis, the NASDAQ once again, the leader. Uh, a lot of high growth companies on the NASDAQ. So that's why, you know, that, that earnings are, are extremely valuable in this low interest rate environment. And when you've got companies like you've got on the NASDAQ that grow their earnings pretty rapidly, that's why you're seeing that continuing outperformance. The uh, mid caps uh, also higher, small caps, <clears throat> excuse me, small caps higher as well, but they did underperform once again. You can see just by looking at the chart, uh, mid caps still quite a ways off of their earlier high back in January. Same thing for the small caps, yet you've got the NASDAQ and the S&P breaking out the new highs. Technology uh, had a really big day yesterday, up 1.35%. Uh, their leadership continues. They break out to a new high. Also worth mentioning, real estate breaking out to a new high. Keep in mind, secular bull markets, they rely on wide participation. We want everything going higher. It's just that we want our aggressive groups going up higher faster or on a, on a relative basis doing a, a much better job. And that's what we've been seeing. We did have that slowdown earlier. We talked about, uh, I think a few weeks ago, I talked about maybe the market topping temporarily because we were starting to see a lot more defensive rotation. Uh, that ended. That ended with the recent breakout, but uh, real estate did have a nice day yesterday, breaking out uh, to new highs, which was encouraging. Discretionary making a move. This whole advance here, a lot of this advance is due to Amazon. Amazon is 23% of the XLY. So if you're trading the XLY or you think you're getting into a really well-diversified uh, ETF um, that is tracking a lot of companies in the discretionary area, um, it's really not that. At 23%, almost a quarter of the performance is based on Amazon, which isn't a bad thing right now because Amazon's broken out. Energy, uh, not having a good day. Materials, not having a good day. Same old, same old. Um, we just got you know the dollar continuing to show strength and resilience. And uh, until the Fed suggests that maybe they're going to cut rates again, I think the dollar is going to continue to cause problems for energy and materials. Although, I'm not so sure we haven't seen a bottom in energy. The last two days, 
you can see the, the moves lower have been mostly at the open. We're not seeing a lot of selling, not a lot of big red candles here uh, the last two days, not like what we were seeing before. So maybe we can make an argument there. We'll have to wait and see. Materials, on the other hand, not too far from a breakout just a couple of days ago, uh, but we've seen selling the last couple of days taking us down to the moving averages. As far as the 10-year Treasury yield goes, I pulled up a long-term chart here. This is a 50-year monthly chart, just to give you a little bit more of a big picture. Um, you know, when we're talking about where rates are now, hard to believe, but back in 1981, I was just getting started in the stock market. We were at 16% on the 10-year Treasury yield. So those of you who haven't been in the market long, think about that for a minute, 16%. Uh, currently, we are at 1.58% um, with this three, uh, these three bottoms down here, just about the 150 area, maybe a little bit below. So the 10-year Treasury yield has moved back down to a pretty key area of support. And what I found interesting is on the way down, we hit this low, and then this was the reaction high. We came back down. We had a little bit of a lower low, as you can see, on a closing basis. And then we went up. We had a little bit more of a closing high than we had seen previously. So we had a false breakdown, false breakout, and now here we are back down at the lows. I look for these lows to hold, but you know, with inflation um, so tame and a really a disinflationary environment with the Fed maybe lowering again, maybe we do see a 10-year Treasury yield that goes down below. But I will say this, the 10-year Treasury yield normally, when we get big drops in the yield that normally relates to a big drop in the financials, well, we're going to move into break it down right now, and I want to break down financials a little bit for you. So let's take a look at the financials. First, you can see this is just the actual bank index. So I want to really concentrate more on banks within the financials. Um, the big breakout was above 465. We had tried getting through there multiple times. We could go back a couple years here. Maybe it uh, would show even better. But you can see all these tops here at about 465, back here around 460, low 460s. Finally, we made that breakout. Once we made that breakout, we really trended higher, had a negative divergence, higher prices, lower PPO, came back down. But again, this was with the 10-year Treasury yield falling recently again. Um, but even with the 10-year the Treasury yield down at 1.58%, the banks rallied last week and moved back up. Now, they're not you know, outperforming the S&P, but they are still performing pretty well. And so I thought what I would do here is just show you a little bit of history here. So the last 10 years on um, the 10-year Treasury yield, or actually list the last 15 years, going back on a TNX chart, monthly chart, so 15-year monthly chart, you can see a few things. I want you to concentrate, number one, on this very steep drop in the 10-year Treasury yield over the past uh, 15 months or so. And when I look back, the only time I've seen this kind of a steep drop in a short period of time was maybe here in 2011. We had this big drop in the 2011. I mean, we went from 4% down to 1.7% in about six or seven months. And that was a pretty big drop, certainly on a, on a uh, level that's par with what we saw back in 2019. Um, and then you could look at 2008. I mean, this was obviously a huge drop back in the financial cri crisis. But those would be the three biggest. Now, I want, I want you to look at what the banks did on a relative basis to the S&P 500 during these three periods. End of 2008, 2011, and then the last 15 months. And take a look at this chart. So this is banks relative to the S&P 500 over the same period. Here was 2008 when we saw that huge drop in the 10-year Treasury yield. Here was 2011 when we saw that huge drop in the 10-year Treasury yield. And here is 2018 and 2019 during this huge drop in the 10-year Treasury yield. You see the difference? Banks got killed in 2008. They were crushed in 2011. And yet, since 2018, maybe a little bit of underperformance, but for the most part, just kind of going along for the ride. If this drop in Treasury yields was a result of the markets believing that our economy was going to slow or that there was a recession ahead, banks would not be 
reacting like this with the treasury yield dropping. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that to me, it's just another angle that helps to explain why the treasury yield is dropping or what the, what the, you know, what's behind it. It's, it's all about the low inflation and the, the lowering expectations of inflation. It has, in my opinion, has nothing to do with the bond market looking out and seeing economic weakness. And that's a big difference. That's why I'm as bullish on equities as I am. This isn't about the, the equity market slowing or, or going into a big decline because earnings are going to uh, hit a wall with a recession, an upcoming recession. I see nothing like that. We just had a great jobs report last week. Um, jobs continue to suggest the economy's fine. We've got GDP at 2%. I think we're probably going to see higher GP GDP. We might see 3% or higher later this year. And all of that with record low interest rates and potentially another cut in interest rates because of the low infl inflation. So I think the banks are primed. I mean, if, if the 10-year Treasury yield continues to go down, okay, maybe we just go sideways in terms of performance with the S&P 500. But if we ever get any kind of an environment where maybe the Fed cuts, we get that uh, the dollar weakening and we get inflation you know, moving higher, uh, commodity prices move up, we get a little inflation, and the 10-year Treasury yield starts to move up with a strong economy, I think banks would lead in that environment. So I think worst case, we kind of go along for the ride. But best case, if we finally do start to see some inflation and we do see the 10-year Treasury yield start to move up, I think banks could be among the leaders. So this is a group that I would definitely uh, be keeping an eye on. Now, what I would do, um, I've got a what I consider my strong earnings chart list. These are companies that have beat top and bottom line. And so when I find a group that I like, like banks, what I do is I just bring up my chart list, I sort it in scooter order, and then I sort it, sort it in industry order. And if you come down here, you'll see banks right here. And here are the top scooters of the banks that I have on my list, which have beaten Wall Street estimates in the latest quarter, uh, both revenue and earnings per share. And so I like, I mean, for instance, one of my favorite banks right now would be CBSH, which is Commerce Bank Shares. Very, very strong performer. You can see the, the, the bank's been going up. It's almost at a high right now, even though 10-year Treasury yield's been dropping and banks overall have not been performing well. CBSH has been a great performer. Look at the relative strength to banks and look at the relative strength to the S&P 500. It's been outperforming the S&P 500, even though banks have not been outperforming the S&P 500. So you got a real leader here with CBSH. So that's kind of my process when I break down a group is I look at the group, I, I try to make a case bullish or bearish, and if I like the group and I'm bullish, then I start looking for the leaders within the group. And I like management teams that are executing. And by executing, I mean they're beating estimates and the stock price is rising. I want stocks that outperform the benchmark S&P 500. So for now, Commerce Bank Share is one of my top uh, stocks. I also like... Um, uh, J.P. Morgan. I mean, if you're looking for something bigger, I think J.P. Morgan's been a great stock here. Beautiful uptrend, pulled back a little bit more than we saw with commerce, but moving back up, not far from a high. Look at the relative strength, breaking out really to new 52-week highs versus the bank. So you have one of the best stocks with J.P. Morgan. All right, let's move on to the biotechs. It's another area with, the, uh, with Break It Down I want to show you. So the biotechs, you look at this chart, and you see we got up near 2,200, pulled back, got up near 2,200. Well, if I stretch this out to five years, here we were at 2,200. Here we had a false breakout above 2,200. Here's 2,200. Here's 2,200. 2,200 is a pretty big deal on this chart. And when you look at other areas of the market, when you get into consolidation periods and then make breakouts, look at internet stocks. We get up to a high in 2018. Test that high, pull back, test that high, pull back. Finally break above at 1,900 back in November. We're at 2,100, 10% higher in two months since then. So when you break up out of these uh, sideways consolidation periods, you want to recognize that. Semiconductors, sideways consolidation for over a year. Make the breakout above 3,800. We're sitting at 4,500 three and a half months later. 
Huge move, almost 20% in three months. Um, let's take a look at the computer hardware group. Uh, computer hardware, hard to remember it, but back in uh, 2018, we topped, and it was a year before we made another breakout. When we made that breakout, that was around 3,100 in October. We're at 4,100 and change. When these groups make breakouts, it's really important to watch it. And it's not just industry groups. Look at XLY, XLY, even back here, 2015, 2016. Look at all these tops, just about the 77, 78 area. Finally made it above in November 2016. This was a group that led that last bull market. Um, and then we could even take a look at a company like Tesla. I know there's a lot of short covering taking place here. But do you see all the sideways consolidation, not able to get through 400? We make it through 400, and this one literally in a month hits 950. Now, this is a little unusual uh, situation, but still, when you make breakouts out of big consolidation periods, it's worth noting. So um, if, the Dow, if this uh, biotech group does make this breakout above 2200, and we are right on the cusp of it right now at 2197.93, uh, what do we do with it? Well, again, I would say you would look back at my, at least I would look back at my strong earnings chart list. I've got it sorted, scooter order by industry. So I go down to biotechs and there are my biotechs on my list. These are some that I would be looking at. Biogen, AbbVie, uh, Seattle Genetics, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Regeneron. Um, those are some names. Regeneron, I think, just got upgraded today or their price target raised. Uh, these are some of the stocks I think look good and also have reported great earnings. Um, bigger companies on the list, you can see that the scooter is much lower, but Amgen. And the reason the scooter is low is you're comparing it to other large cap stocks that are in other industry groups. Remember, biotech has not been a great area. So you're going to see a lot of these. I mean, the fact that some of these have scooter scores in the 90s is pretty impressive, considering their group hasn't even broken out. So that's the way I would approach the market. And some of these areas. When I break it down, I look at groups that I think could become leaders. I look for reasons that could drive more buyers into those groups. And then I break it down looking for individual stocks where I can get my biggest bang for the buck if I'm right. Uh, one other thing I'll show you here on the biotechs that you might not be familiar with. If you go uh, back to your dashboard and go into the uh, scooter reports and pull up this, is, uh, this shows you the top scooter ranked stocks in each of the categories, asset classes, large cap, mid cap. I'm going to bring up small cap. Look at small cap. Notice all the biotechs on here. There are a lot of small cap biotechs. And so if the biotechs break out, and I'm not saying you want to rush into these because any one of these, you know, I think trades more on its own merits. And if one of them comes out with bad news, the stock's going to go down. I don't care if the index is going up or not. But one thing you can do is you can look at something like the XBI, which is an ETF that tracks the biotechs. But there's no one stock in this biotech ETF that um, represents more than 2% of the ETF. So it's a very widely diversified ETF. So if the group breaks out, you can get exposure uh, um, you can get exposure among a lot of different biotechs without having to buy individual stocks. I think the XBI could be a great strategy. Now, the IBB is another strategy, but I'll tell you, I think there are five stocks that account for about 35% of it. Um, and I don't recall off the top of my head which ones they are, but there are about five of them. So I'd have to go back. I think Gilead's one, which is, hasn't been a great performer, uh, but I think Vertex and maybe a couple other strong ones are in there as well. But, you know, they kind of look the same. But if you look over long periods of time, the XBI and the IBB tend to trade quite a bit differently. And I would probably favor the XBI just so I'd get that wide diversification. All right, let's move on to earnings spotlight. Um, and the first earnings report that I want to bring up for you is a company that just knocked it out of the park again yesterday. And that was Ring Central RNG. Uh, the company came out, uh, easily beat revenues. Bottom line was just 22 cents versus 21 cents, but they did guide their fiscal year 20 revenues higher. And the stock is up more than 5% in pre market. This is one at my Earnings Beats uh, webinar last night I talked about. I really liked Ring Central going into its earnings report. 
for a couple of different reasons. Computer services just made a big breakout above a high that we saw in 2019. Um, the group is starting to show relative strength. And then look at Ring relative to the group. So you've got one of the strongest stocks in an improving group. And we saw why uh, last night with the earnings report. Uh, another big earnings report that came out, um, Amcor, A-M-K-R. This is uh, Amcor Technology. Yesterday on my show, I do a 9 a.m. show over at Earnings Beats, uh, similar to this one, kind of same format. Um, but I was on there yesterday and talked about two stocks that we had in our portfolios, Amcor and Digital Turbine, APPS. And I said both of them were going to be reporting after the bell yesterday. And when I looked at the charts, the one I gave the better chance of uh, coming up with a really good report was Amcor. And the reason was pretty simple. Number one, it had a huge report last quarter. And so that type of relative strength, uh, when the stock goes from 11 to 15 in a day, of course, it's outperforming its group. Uh, it had a huge spike. And during this entire period of consolidation and moving all the way back to test this gap support, the semiconductors were continuing to move higher. So obviously, you're going to see uh, relative weakness, which we saw. But when I looked at volume trends, except for maybe just a couple of days more recently, we got a little bit more volume. I've thought the volume trends have been strong. It's in a, a really strong group. Here was the earnings reaction in July. Here was the earnings reaction in October. I just felt like this one had a chance, much better chance to come through. They came out, they blew away their uh, earnings and uh, revenue estimates. Revenues, they beat by about 7%. Uh, earnings, bottom line, 41 cents versus 22 cents. The stock uh, this morning, last time I looked up 16.6% in pre-market. So it looks like it's gonna have another big gap up. Whether or not it holds, We'll have to see. Uh, last time I looked, it was around 1350 or so. So that's going to be an area, 1350, 14. If it gets through both of those, then it's got this $15 level to look at. Uh, let's see. Another big report came out this morning was AutoNation, A-N. Uh, AutoNation, stock had been downtrending. This is one I would not have really liked going into earnings because it was a specialty retailer that was performing very poorly relative to its peers. And specialty retail versus the S&P, not doing very well. Uh, but nonetheless, we did have a, a good report here. AutoNation beat top line, bottom line a buck 31 versus a buck 15. Stock's up 9% in pre-market. Now I'm going to look to see if this has a positive divergence. No, it really didn't. Lower PPO with the lower price. Um, but it is looking to move up uh, 9%, which would be what, roughly... Uh, $3.90 or so. Uh, so that's going to take us up into the neighborhood around 47 and a half, probably right at about the 50 day moving average. Remember, when everybody's buying at the open, you got market makers on the other side. A lot of stocks will pull back after that. So I wouldn't be surprised to see AutoNation maybe pulling back. Uh, a couple of other stocks uh, that reported, I won't bring the charts up. We'll go through, uh, I want to get into the um, uh, upgrades and downgrades in just a second. But Hasbro, Really strong earnings report, buck 24 versus 89 cents, up 6% in pre-market. Um, XPO Logistics missed on their revenues, but easily beat bottom line, buck 12 versus buck two. And that is that stock's up 2.7% in pre-market. Uh, probably one of the biggest losers um, was uh, Mercado Libre, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. M-E-L-I is the ticker symbol. Big miss on the bottom line, a buck 11 loss. Market was only expecting 69 cent loss. Stock's down about 5% in pre-market. All right, let's move on to the upgrades and downgrades. Just give you a couple of these quickly. FLIR is being upgraded today. A lot of overhead resistance up here around 55 and change. I'm going to give you a number. If it opens above this, it has a chance to run here, 55.26. So if we could get an open above that, which would require about a buck 35 or so uh, open, so that would need to go up a couple percent at the open. If it did, maybe it, it gaps up and keeps running. If it doesn't open above that, we could just continue to be mired in this sideways consolidation, though. Uh, next, um, REGN was upgraded. I mentioned that one with the biotechs. Stock had fallen back quite a bit at the end of January, but came roaring back with volume and its earnings. Here was the earnings right here. Tried to make the breakout, couldn't make it, but getting upgraded today, so maybe it does make the breakout. Anything above 395 would start to look really good with REGN. 
Uh, one downgrade I wanted to mention, Facebook, getting a sell rating from Pivotal Research. Um, I don't know about a sell rating. Let's take a look at the relative strength here. It is in the internet space, which is still you know, on the verge of breaking out, but Facebook is not performing well relative to the internet group. So it has not been one of the strongest stocks. It did gap down on some big volume. I would be watching the recent low here to the downside, 201, 202. Would not want to lose that level. Uh, but you don't get too many sell ratings on Wall Street. Not too many firms want to put a sell rating on a stock. Um, it, it's hard to get their business uh, for underwriting activity or whatever uh, after you've uh, put a sell order on a, on a company. So don't see it very often, but uh, Facebook did get one today. All right, let's move on to the three you must see. And I am going to start with Twitter. All right, I... You know, this one. This is a teaching moment. Number one, you go into this into the earnings report. I was not expecting anything from Twitter, and they actually. I didn't think their report was that strong, but user numbers were strong, better than expected. So we got the big gap up, heavy volume. I just want to point out here that why these resistance levels are so big. Here you can see was that this is where we gapped down with earnings back in October, and look at the volume on all this selling. We finally made our way all the way back to gap resistance. Intraday, we went above it. We couldn't hold it. And when you fail like that, that normally sets up for more selling. And that is what we have been seeing on Twitter. I think you've got gap support down 33 and change. You've got the 20-day moving average moving up above 34. I would not be surprised to see Twitter move back down there. Although, strong market again today. Who knows? Maybe, maybe we do see a little bit more there. Uh, let's take a look here at um, next up. I'm going to show you Foot Locker. When you look at the chart, you're going to be like, all right, what do you see here? Uh, I really don't see a whole lot here with Foot Locker. Um, you know, the stock had been downtrending for a while. Then it went through sideways consolidation, started to maybe show a little bit of strength to open the month and pulls back. Honestly, on the chart, you can see it's one of the worst performers in the apparel retail group and apparel retail hasn't exactly been on fire. So there's really not a whole light to, lot to like here, except I will say that if you go to seasonality and pull up seasonality, um, I would be looking at February and March because, I mean, we're in February, today's February 11th, and here you've got February and March, two of the best months in terms of the odds that Foot Locker will close higher as we move forward. So you got pretty strong odds here. Um, and then down here at the bottom, you can see the average monthly return over the last 20 years. February, 3.1%, March, 5.9%. So when you take those two months combined, that's 9% average return during February and March over the last 20 years. So while the chart doesn't look all that great, I do think that it's a pretty strong um, seasonal period for the stock. So maybe if you get down here closer to the support level, knowing that the seasonality is strong, maybe that gives you a reason to take a shot with the stock. All right. And I am going to wrap up with one of the FANG stocks. I mean, I've talked about this one a lot, but Amazon to me just looks like a beast. And I, I just want to reiterate how strong the group looks. First of all, you can see Broadline Retail making a breakout here. You can see Broadline Retail also quickly moving up, or that's Amazon moving up versus the S&P. But here you can see Broadline Retail moving up versus the S&P 500. So you really got some great action here. And this breakout, one last quick chart, when you look at the weekly, see the sideways consolidation we just broke out, measures to 2,700 to 2,800. I like Amazon a lot going forward. Okay, uh, that is it for today. I want to thank everybody for stopping by. Wish everybody a great day and happy trading.